for the uh, invitation, although I guess when, when I agreed, I didn't quite realize it would be nine hours. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't had as much time to prepare as I might have liked, and it's a bit of a of a funny pathway through through this topic, which I'll take you through. And I, I should say also, of course, in the original plan, the, uh, Isaac Held is the other large-scale atmospheric dynamics lecture. Uh, for scheduling reasons, we couldn't be here in the same week. Actually, it's interesting, so I'll, I'll get to hear Hank, which I'm very um, fond of. But for you, of course, it'll be it'll be a bit confusing, perhaps. But uh, we, when in, in talking with Isaac, we, we decided the way that we would largely d divide it up, at least the f first order, is I'll focus on uh, what, what are called barotropic aspects. So bar barotropic basically means things that don't depend on ho horizontal temperature gradients, or that you can derive from the the momentum or the vorticity uh, equation uh, alone, although you can't entirely ignore uh, um, the uh, baroclinic processes in these models, as I'll talk about. And Isaac will focus on the baroclinic processes and, and the moist processes. So the, 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 the there is a certain logic to that anyway, because the barotropic part is, is the is the simpler part. Um, and so, in terms of the lectures, what I was what I have planned. I mean, we'll see. How it goes, maybe I, I can adapt. Um, and by the way, it'll be about f half equations, ha half um, uh, 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 figures. And um, today will mainly be be figures. And I don't expect to go on the board. I, I've I've told the the only um, sacred rule here is that you must have the coffee break on time. So uh, I will stick to that. So I, I if there's time at the end, I might I might do some board work, but for t today I just plan to put to put the equations up on the screen, but beginning tomorrow I'll, I'll, I'll work on the board. So first thing I'm going to do is actually, it's, it's really funny because t Tapio basically <laughs> gave almost well, the, the same lecture yesterday evening, which I hadn't realized was, what, what was going to happen, but I think this could be useful, um, and it's a little bit, there are some differences anyway. So I'm going to talk about the large, the, the, the large scale picture with uh, uh, only observations. Um, I think it's, you know, it's funny, I was in Toronto in a physics uh, department for tw uh, tw 25 years and you always start with equations and you start from fir first principles and work forward, you know, very r r rigorous. But at, at r r Reading, may may maybe because of the uh, Brian Hoskins influence, you start with the observations and it's, it's, it's taken me some, <laughs> some time to think that way, but I, I, th I th think it's, it's pr pretty important. The second lecture, um, because actually, although I, I, s I said barotropic, but um, the topic of internal gravity waves is going to come up in the, in the lecture, and certainly it'll come up in the ocean th the lectures. You'll be hearing quite a lot about that from uh, Ra Ra Raffarari uh, and Oliver B Bueller, actually, on early next week as well. So I'm going to talk about what's called balanced and unbalanced <laughs> dynamics in the shallow water equations, which is the simplest equation. These are, of course, not internal gravity waves or surface gravity waves, but it's but it, but um, so that'll be just going through the very b basic breakdown of the balanced and what we call the unbalanced and balanced components or the <laughs> vortical and the gravity wave components. And then in the third lecture, I'll talk about two-dimensional two turbulence and also a bit about shallow water turbulence. So two-dimensional turbulence is, is a classic problem in the vorticity equation and sh shallow water includes the, the, the gravity wave part. And something called the gauge Nystrom <laughs> spectrum. Um, so just as a quick uh, uh, intro um, on the large scales the uh, the the, uh, the atmosphere actually r r rather r r remarkably falls wave number to the minus three energy pow power law which is the prediction of two two dimensional turbulence but then it uh, transitions at scales of about a hundred kilometers well it depends on the altitude but um, to a minus five thirds but it's not the the, 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 the of minus five thirds which of course is v v very small scale it's something else, and uh, that's called the gauge Nystrom <laughs> spectrum. It involves gravity waves, and um, I'll also say a little bit about the I implications for uh, predictability of these different power laws. Um, then in the fourth lecture, I'll talk about Rossby waves. Now, it's true it's turbulence, um, but the, very the, the nature uh, of the turbulence is very much shaped by, by the beta term, and the fact that, um, I mean, wh whether you want to call the, the, the the disturbances w waves or not. They're not waves probably in a li linear sense, but there's still enough of the properties of uh, Ross waves that's important. And you can't understand the, m the, the <laughs> momentum flux picture without understanding the beta effect and, and the role. And I'll uh, ma make, make a bit of a foray into um, 
Hamiltonian uh, ge 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 geophysical fluid dynamics, which is an old love of mine, because it's a way of understanding how the simple theories for barotropic systems actually uh, generalize to the full primitive equations and so on, as well as a baroclinic system. So that's the concept of pseudo momentum. In the fifth lecture, um, talk about the pr the the theory of the <laughs> interaction. We, we we call them waves, but just think of them as the the eddies or the turbulence and the mean flow in the barotropic context, um, this one layer context. And finally. Talk, come back to two-dimensional <laughs> turbulence, but of course we don't have pure 2D turbulence at, at all I I in the atmosphere for a number of reasons. The uh, principal one being the fact we have z zonal jets. And talk a little. This will be a much more open lecture, and we'll also get into some um, some current thoughts uh, I have about uh, we get getting to mo models and model errors, and a little bit about climate change. Okay, so that's the that's the plan. Um, so this is the first is the uh, phenomenology. So um, is this, uh, I'm not writing a, a, a textbook, so I don't have such nice slides as t Tapio has. And I've taken pretty much everything from the Era 40 Atlas. So Era 40 was a predecessor of Era I I I I I Interim. These are, we treat them as observations. They're actually what are called reanalyses, which, are, which are, uh, assimilate the observations to provide a consistent data set. Um, I think for everything that either of us have shown, uh, you can treat them as uh, observations, really. You don't want to start looking at trends in Era 40 because there's issues about <laughs> homogeneity and time. And Era 40 was the er earlier version. Era interim, which Tapio showed, is a, is a more um, modern product. But, uh, but this is very convenient because it's just on the web and you can quickly grab, grab shots. So, and I showed potential temperature and I realized how many of you do not know what potential temperature is? Oh, good. You all know. Did I ask, ask that the wrong way around? Oh, you had it. Okay. Oh, yes, of course. All right, because I was a bit worried. Okay. So if so, you you all know what potential. That's good. So so it's a function. If um, it, this actually I, I, in a way. So this is showing a stratification, which is showing. And by the way, northern he hemisphere is on the left. Um, in the era 40 uh, uh, atlas, which is the weather forecasting uh, convention. Um, so you see a weak stratification in the tropics because of moisture and a str stronger stratification in the extratropics. But the main feature here is that, uh, is that the temperature gradient, the so at, at a given pressure, it's just theta is just the temperature. So you see that, that the um, temperature gradients are very flat in the tropics, uh, as Tapio also showed, and then you get these gr gradients at the, the, the middle latitude. So who does not know about thermal wind? Okay, I was a bit, oh, okay, a few people perhaps. So the, f the fact that you have these slanting um, uh, temperature, which means that there's a horizontal temperature gradient, if there was no r r r rotation, this couldn't be f f sustained. You know, if you, have a lab, if you have a lab experiment and you put heavy fluid on the right, on the left, and light fluid on the right, it, and, and you p it'll, it'll, it'll e e e even out. But because of r rotation, we have Coriolis force, and so, there's a pressure gradient which is acting from the tropics to the high, ha, 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 higher latitudes, and that's balanced by the Coriolis force connected, uh, uh, associated with a westerly wind. So you can maintain a horizontal temperature gradient because of the Coriolis force. Um, but you can't do that in the tropics because the Coriolis force goes to zero, which is why, why the temperature becomes flat. But what this means is, you've, is you've, you've got potential energy. This is stably stratified, so there's no uh, convection in this, in this um, Zonal in this global zonal average sense, but you can see that you've got um, warm, warm air in, 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 the, in the tropics and cold air in the extratropics. So although it's held in a steady state by this um, geostrophic balance, or thermal wind balance is what you call it when it involves temperature, you can see that there is potential to re re release potential energy because you've got cold air sitting at a higher altitude than warm air. And if you can mix, if you can somehow release that, that's an energy source. That's called uh, available potential e e e energy, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Isaac Held will, t will, will talk about that in his lecture. So that it's, uh, in, in fact, it's unstable, and that's what's called baroclinic instability, and that can be re released. So it's called ba uh, baroclinicity is, this, is the, is, is the um, potential energy you have connected with the um, horizontal temperature gradient. 
Okay, I'm happy to show this one too. Um, as I said, you, you, you can't sustain large horizontal temperature, temperature gradients in the tropics because of the small coralless force. If you, I guess if I go on the board now, they won't see me. Is that right? Or can I, can you? Okay. I mean, basically, you, you have, have a sphere and the, um, the, the, the centrifugal forces are acting outward, but it, so if you're right at the equator and you ha ha have a temperature gradient, that would, that would drive, that would be a force acting um, parallel to, to the axis of r rotation, and there's no way that that can be balanced. So that forces you to have um, um, uh, weak temperature gradients. Um, and the Hadley uh, circulation, in principle, we say dr driven. You've got to be careful with these, with these concepts, but the simplest explanation we've got, the warm sea surface temperatures, I I in the tropics and latent heat release, you would have heard a, a lot about this l last week, and that drives ascent here. This is in the annual mean picture, and then descent in these subtropical regions, about 30 degrees. Sorry. Um, so these, this is what the f the f the, the so-called feral cells, but this the, the the Hadley cell is the main feature. Um, yeah, Tapio also show this on the so if you show evaporation minus uh, precipitation, you have a net net evaporation in the subtropics and net uh, precipitation both in the deep tropics and at the hi higher latitudes. So conservation of, of moisture is telling you that there must be a flux of moisture from the subtropics <laughs> into the tropics and also in a higher latitudes. And cer certainly from this map, it's very, very clear you see the deserts. Of course, the deserts have no, no evaporation because there's no, no water, but, um, and the rain, the rain belts emerge very quickly. Um, easily from this picture. But if you look at the um, water vapor content, you see that the most, the highest amount of water vapor, this is, a co this is the integrated water vapor I in, the, in, the, in the column, is highest I I in the tropics. So from a turbulence point of view, that al already should have you a little bit scratching because the, although the water vapor transport to <laughs> high latitudes is down gradient, and we just, we just dis that's basically mixing by, 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 by these baroclinic storms and eddies, we see that the ho that the wo water vapor transfer um, transport is up gradient, so that's not just a random process. And of course, y if if it's a random process and and the tracer is uh, uh, uncorrelated, then then you get um, always down gradient transport in turbulence. But it means that there's coherent some kind of coherent motion, and the coherent motion I is the Hadley circulation. Um, so whether you want to call the Hadley circulation turbulent or, n or not becomes a bit semantic. Obviously, it's driven by turbulence, and, and, but it's a coherent structure. And of course, the turbulence we're seeing in the atmosphere always involves a mixture of coherent structures as well as the more classic turbulence. So if you know about <laughs> a thermal wind, that's good. Um, I can quickly talk to you uh, afterwards if, if you're not sure. But uh, so it means that if y um, the geostrophic balance is between pressure, uh, the horizontal pressure gradient, and the, ver and, the, um, and the wind, and then if you take a vertical a derivative of that, 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 you can relate the vertical shear, du dz, of the wind to the horizontal temperature gradient. And so the fact we have a warm tropics means we have westerly winds in, in, in the exotropics. And this is the, f is, is the jet stream. Uh, and as Tapio mentioned uh, he, 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 he yesterday, when you take this, um, this is zonal mean. You see a, ba a single maximum I in the northern hemisphere, uh, but you see this um, hint of a second jet uh, in in the southern hemisphere, uh, with very strong surface winds, much much stronger. So there's quite a an asymmetry between the two hemispheres here. Um, well, that's b so the the maximum is uh, yeah, and I don't have have the picture for it actually, but. Um, Unfortunately, Tapio's had it. Yeah, actually, it's very cold here. So the cold, well, there are there are a lot of cold temperatures. So the, there's cold temperatures, of course, in the a a Antarctic a a at the surface, but there's also very cold temperatures at the tropical tropopause. And it's the 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 temperatures are actually, which is up around. Uh, this is uh, uh, actually it's a bit. Th th this isn't the best plot to show that, but so maybe I'll draw a quick. So the this is um, height, and this is. Equator, North Pole, South Pole. So this is the tropopause here, and the tropopause is is deeper I in the tropics, basically because you have a convection which can which can propagate very very high. Whereas in the exotropics, it's 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 a baroclinic instability. So if you follow a moist 
adiabat, that means the temperatures are decreasing with height. So when you go up here, you get very cold temperatures. And so now, um, so that cuts off the, 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 the maximum jets that are here. So you have warm here, but actually it's colder in the tropics that the, than in the, in the middle latitude. So that's why, why, why the jet maximizes are the tropopause. Actually, it's an even colder region if you go up to the uh, summer mesopause. And that is not radiative because it's in, I in the summertime. That, that's another story in itself, which I won't go into. Um, Oh, where am I? Right. So um, I, d I decided to leave these on the um, on the on the on the screen rather than write them. I I, I apologize because I know that it's you you can start going through equations awfully quickly if you put them on a screen. But this is not too complicated. So the first order explanation of this um, of why the why it's a subtropical jet, and I guess it's connected. I mean, there's always more than one way to uh, explain something. So I gave you an explanation of the jet maximum at the tropopause because of, of temperature. You can have other e explanations. They're not inconsistent because all these things are actually relationships. And perhaps, you know, when you think, uh, it, the challenge of this, and I think Tapio alluded to th this when he said that it wasn't much that we really uh, uh, understood. A lot of things that we call explanations, if you think about them de deeply enough, they're not really explanations. They're just consistency r relationships. And uh, causality is a, a very uh, tricky thing. But anyway, the simple uh, explanation is conservation of angular moment momentum. So if we're on, 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 the, uh, on the sphere, rotating sphere, there's a component of angular momentum. So it's just the, um, uh, it's just R cross V, right, is angular m momentum. So the moment arm, if you're on at some place here, this is A cos of phi. A is, is the radius of the Earth, co um, phi is latitude. So this is the, 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 the moment arm. And the vo velocity is, is the zonal or the east-west velocity connected with the rotation of the Earth, omega A cosine of phi, plus U, which is the relative uh, velocity. So U is, is the, um, the east-west uh, flow in, in the rotating system. So this is just R, R cross V, the classic angular momentum so you 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 have a thought experiment where you where you move a parcel of air actually it's a ring of air um, forward and you start with u equals zero at the equator which is a pretty good approximation because the winds are very uh, zonal winds are very weak there and so you have to conserve angular momentum so this is angular mom momentum here as a function of the latitude uh, just the same equation I've got here but it is zero is at the equator, and if u is zero at the equator and cosine is one, then you just get a, a, a squared times omega. So if you solve this, you'll get a one minus co cosine squared, which gives you a sine squared. So we see that the wind is going to be omega a sine squared over cosine. So that is a prediction if you just start with zero um, of a z zonal wind at the equator and you start to move northward. But obviously, as you go to the poles, plus or minus pi over two, this is going to diverge. So that can't happen. So that will eventually something has to limit the, the, the Hadley cell. And um, there was a very influential paper by <laughs> Held and Howe in 1980, uh, which um, uh, ha this inviscid nonlinear theory of the Hadley cell, but argues that the if, you, if you accept that there, there's an equator to pole temperature difference, which is going to limit this. So it depends on a bunch of things. It depends on the equator to pole temperature difference, depends on the radius of the Earth, depends on rotation rate depends on the depth of the of, of, the, of the troposphere so it'll be different for different planets um, and you get ha Hadley cells extent so depending on your planetary re regime the Hadley cell could go all the way to the pole or or it w it'll have to be limited well it, it can't go really all the way to the pole but it can go much further so they actually got a, a prediction of about 30 degrees which is kind of amazing because that's really very very close to the way things actually are but as I'll show you in a second, it's not quite that simple. But this is the first order e e explanation. And it's also why, why the winds are strong in the upper troposphere then, because they're basically, it's coming from this angular momentum. So you'd argue that these maxima are essentially driven by the Hadley circulation. Um, Now, uh, but it's important that we do re re remember that there's, you can, of course, take, take a zonal average, and there's nothing wrong. Some people say that you shouldn't take a zonal average, but, I mean, you're allowed to 
integrate, seems to me, and <laughs> there are there are conservation principles that are seem pretty fundamental. So I, I, I think it's perfectly fine to take a zonal average. There's n you know nothing wrong with that. But you do have to recognize that there are, uh, are details that that will be washed over. And so this is the annual mean, and you see that that uh, this is the wind. This is the wind. Uh, so the wi wind speed uh, as attacks are shown in the contours, and, and there's a scale here, and then there's a vector uh, to the wind as well. And this is at 200 hectopascal, which is about eight kilometers uh, altitude. Oh, c um, wind speed. So it's constant wind speed. Yeah, this is a, me a, me a meteorological uh, convention. Yeah, wi wind speed. So you see that. You see that the strongest jets, indeed, at 200 hectopascal, maybe just go quickly back. Um, 200 is up here, actually. Uh, but 200, you see, see that these mid-latitude jets. But th first of all, there's, um, you see that there's a variation I in the northern hemisphere. So there's a Pacific jet and the Atlantic jet, it's called. Although you can see here, it's actually maximum over the uh, east coast of North America. And then there's another jet building up uh, just south of the Mediterranean, um, but in the southern hemisphere, uh, you see actually that this what l what looks like a double jet is actually double jets at different li different longitudes. So you don't necessarily want to think of that as, as a double jet in in a zonally homogeneous case. Obviously, there's some lo 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 longitudinal uh, structure here that ultimately should be part of your thinking. Um, so that's kind of an an important. Um, Feature, so you're certainly allowed to take to take the zonal average. But if you're going to look at, say, if you want to if you want to understand how the jet affects regional climate, and you live in Australia, you don't want to you you, you want to be conscious of the fact that there's there's a very strong jet here. Um, so there's a uh, a se se seasonality to it that's quite strong. So the jet stream is um, the strongest by far in the winter season. So this is the same plots, the wind at 200 hectopascal and the, wi the wind speed, the vector and the wind speed. This is June through August, so it's the um, uh, northern summer and then December through February, which is the northern winter. And you can see that the strongest jets are in the southern winter here and in the northern winter here, and rather weaker jets in the summer hemisphere. Um, there is, and, and you see that the jets are also much more that the strong jet is basically in the subtropics. I guess they don't, you don't. Uh, so that must be so. Th you can't quite see on these plots, but 30 degrees must be in, a, in about here. So this is uh, 30 degrees or so, and then um, so this Australian uh, jet is is the dominant jet in the in the southern winter, and in the northern w w winter you can see that the jet is also um, very strong at the in the subtropics, and when you go to the summer, um, it's not 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 a huge shift uh, as as to, to Tapio said. To first order, they're in the same place, but if you look in detail, you can see that there I this is ma maximizing south of uh, 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 Japan. This is a little bit higher latitude. You see that the jet max here is. Um, off of Newfoundland or so. Here it's a little bit further south, and also here, uh, North, North Africa, mi Middle East, but the jet moves in, into into southern Europe. So there's a slight shift. And then you can also see, um, especially in the winter, um, there's, uh, at certain latitudes, there's quite a polar tilt. So this is, this is an I interesting feature that the jet is fairly zonal in the Northern Hemisphere over, over, uh, over Asia, and the Pacific, but then it gets to be a very strong tilt over the North Atlantic. There's a few reasons for that. I won't have a chance to to go into that, but one of the um, uh, reasons is is the Rocky Mountains, which which give you uh, a, a a mountain wave, which gives you that um, that kind of a tilt. You also have a tilting coastline, so we have the warm sea surface temperatures off the Gulf Stream, but but qu a quite a strong tilt here. So it's it's, it's an interesting. Um, feature because actually it's the feature the models tend not to get very well. So climate models really <laughs> struggle to get the right tilt, which means we really don't uh, understand it that well. So I think the um, a lot of things are understood uh, qualitatively, but if you actually are talking, so we say that to, to first order the, these, the, this is at the same same latitude as here, but actually, of course, if you're dealing with climate change, these things really matter, like s Southern Europe versus Northern Europe is a very important difference which is not very big on this map. Um, but things like the jet tilt, uh, obviously, uh, I 
in Europe. I never really thought about the jet tilt much li living in Canada, but in, in uh, UK it's a huge topic. Um, also, you see it in the southern hemisphere too, that there's this um, poleward tilt, which of course doesn't have any obvious uh, well, there's there's the the, uh, the Andes here too. There are also uh, uh, dynamics of the eddies themselves that will lead to uh, to a poleward mi <laughs> migration, but then why doesn't it work here? So you can always come up with with, 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 with an argument for something, but it doesn't mean it's it's the right argument. Um, so there are ma many theories of all these things. Yeah. Um, well, the um, in the case of this one, this is actually I'll, I'll come to this in a second. It's connect. I guess it's connected. Yeah, I'm not sure about all these different cases. I mean, because um, you would argue it, it's it's probably going to be different arguments in different re reasons. Here, actually, this is to do with the the, the, the monsoon circulation because that this is in the northern summer. And there's a cross, um, maybe I'll show that first. So the first order explanation of why the, why the subtropical jet is strongest I in the winter is basically comes from the Hadley circulation. So the picture I showed before was the, um, was the annual average Hadley circulation and the ascent was over the equator. But um, of course the sun moves back and forth and, and so across the equator. And so in the uh, northern summer, the, th 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 the convection and the ascent is on the northern side of, of, of the equator because that's wh wh where, the wh where the heating is. So you see that the ascent here is around 20 degrees north. And the Hadley cell actually is, is mainly one Hadley cell. So you get the picture I showed earlier is the classic equinox picture, which is, the, which is also seen in the annual mean. But, th but at the sol solstice, you largely have just a single Hadley cell, which goes across the equator. So it's rising on the summer side and then it crosses I I into the winter side and goes down. But it's, you see it goes further here than it, than it was here. And so from conservation of angular momentum, I shouldn't take U as zero anymore. It'll be something else. But you, you're going to get the, the, the maximum winds here. Similarly, for the northern winter, southern summer, the ascent is on the summer side. And then the maximum winds are going to be on the w w winter side. So you expect the strongest jet to be in the winter hemisphere, but in the <laughs> subtropics. And so this, but in fact, I haven't got a, got a picture for it, but this so-called Hadley circulation, if you look at maps, it's very localized. So it's not just evenly across the whole globe. It's very much localized to wh 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 where the convection happens. And so this, this so-called um, uh, warm pool area, and monsoon is part of that, is you get a huge amount of ascent in this region. So I think this is probably connected with the, with that pole, with the, sorry, um, with the trans, with the uh, flow into the w w w winter hemisphere, so it's not, not nothing to do w w w with Australia, but it, but it ha has to do with the land features here because you get strongest heating over land. Um, these other features, uh, as I, I've already talked about, that th this one is coming partly from top topography. So yes, that's that's land. Uh, although of course, topographic waves have a downstream influence, and um, so and the. Uh, I guess it's true that in the winter you have um, strongest temperature gradients uh, over land, as as tap. I forget, yeah, you were sorry, you were um, as tap is in e o o ocean. Of course, has has a lot of thermal inertia, so you get the strongest as seasonal cycle over land. And so, from a from a temperature argument and a th a thermal wind, you would expect strongest jets to be connected with land somehow. But as I say, there's also I influences from topography and then this ha Hadley circulation. Right. Now, um, I don't show many daily maps. It is a good idea also to show uh, d daily maps. It's not in my, this is just uh, what's called the analysis. So this is what, what the ECMWF, the Euro European Center for Me Medium Range Weather Forecast I I I in Reading. This is just a si single day. This is now a stream function. I think you all know what a stream function is. Uh, so the you, c you can see that the westerly jet is is present. You know it isn't that you, it, it doesn't require a lot of averaging. You see that jet every day. It helps in the stream function because that's a, a smoother version. Um, 
but it does d does meander qu uh, quite a lot. So you should look at um, you sh you you have to be aware that there's a lot of uh, <coughs> variability. Um, in there. Uh, what did I else say that I want to say about this? Yeah, but you can still see the main the main features. This is in um, uh, <laughs> November. Okay, now um. So I'm, I try to be a barotropic, but of course the whole system is driven thermally, so you can't uh, avoid some discussion of the energy balance. And so uh, the, this is um, these are pl plots that show the energy balance of the of the climate system. Um, this is the uh, this is the is, is the uh, top of the atmosphere energy balance is called, which is uh, quite well constrained by satellites. Although it's it's amazing, I, it's the there are still enough errors in in those <laughs> budgets that if you want to say that the earth that the climate system is receiving more energy than it's than it's giving out because the simplest answer to a climate a skeptic would be you know even if there was a <laughs> hiatus going on as there had been it doesn't matter as long as the climate system is getting energy and and i said we we know there's more energy coming in than going out but i looked at ipcc and we don't know that they adjust the outgoing to match the the energy. I mean, the 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 accuracy. The, they're very uh, precise measurements, but the accuracy isn't quite good enough to because there's so many big terms there. It's a small difference of large terms. So unfortunately, from a climate change point of view, it's not quite a, a, as good as it a, as it should be. But but certainly for climate, it's absolutely fine. So this is the Earth uh, radiation budget experiment, I guess, which must be uh, which this is from a long time ago. So what you see is that the absorbed solar radiation it ha has a maximum. I in the tropics, it's it's of course mainly in the tropics because of geometry, because the sun is coming straight onto the globe here. It's at an angle. Uh, of course, you've got albedo, the, 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 the reflection from clouds and and ice and snow, but it gives you this pattern. Then the outgoing long wave radiation. Um, uh, yeah, it would be the net. It would be. Um, yeah, I it's basically taking out out the, the, the reflected part. So that's why you have uh, these. Um, so that's why you have actually re regions here that will be cl clear sky will be largest. So it's ba it's basically just because the simple thing is to take the the uh, the energy coming in and then uh, uh, subtract out the the, 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 the the reflected. So it's it's to do. It's in the spectral range, so it says solar. You can you can pick that out in terms of the frequency, and it's just the um, incoming minus the outgoing, and the outgoing is the the, 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 the reflected. Yeah, so it would include clouds as well as snow, nice. And you'll see that the um, actually the outgoing, uh, which is which is the uh, infrared emission or the long wave, is a little more complicated because you have maxima in these uh, subtropics, and that's because you've got uh, basically. Um, Clear areas, so the radiation is coming from much lower in the atmosphere, um, whereas in the in the deep deep tropics, it's coming from higher because of clouds. So actually, it's not it's not a peak in the tropics, even though it's warmest I in the tropics because of the cl cloud effects, which affect how visible the the surface is to to space. But largely, it's my maximum in the tropics, and then d decays because it's warmest in the tropics and decays. But if you plot these two on top of each other down here, and you get the net. You see that there's a net um, that there's more absorbed solar radiation I in the tropics than there's outgoing, and there's more, and and at the hi higher latitudes, there's more outgoing than there is coming in. So that means that there's net net heating the climate system in the tropics and net cooling I I in extratropics. If you average this over the whole globe, it's it's about zero to first approximation because the climate system is largely a, a in a steady state. There's some variability and of course there's also climate change. But the climate change part is very small on this scale. Um, and, I, I, and I guess, m I don't know whether whether Hank will, will, will talk about this, but from a thermodynamic point of view, it has to be this way. Second law of thermodynamics, you have to, the, you must heat the system where it's warm and you must cool it where it's cold because you have to be de decreasing a, a entropy. So, um, so the atmosphere is a classic heat a engine which is being he heated where it's warm and be cooled where it's cold. Interestingly, if you go up, up in the atmosphere and in the stratosphere, uh, mesosphere, it's a refrigerator, whereas it's a mechanically forced system. But that's that's another story, which I won't go into. 
So this, of course, impl implies poleward heat ch transport by the climate system. Um, Tapia showed this plot too, uh, although it's maybe an earlier paper, but it's basically the same plot. So the poleward, he, he was emphasizing the important role of the ocean, but actually, as, as, he, as he pointed out, w once you get to middle latitudes, the ocean is really negligible. And so most of the heat transport is carried by the atmosphere, and the, and the peak is in the middle latitudes, so the atmosphere is shown here. And actually, what the kind of the most amazing thing about this, this, this is from observations, um, I've shown you lots of differences between the northern and southern hemisphere. Jets are in the different, different places. Um, strength of the jet is very different. Tapia showed some pretty big differences in temperature as well. But the remarkable thing is that uh, within observational uh, uncertainty, this peak value equals that peak value. So how can these two hemispheres that are so different have the same energy transport? And there's a paper by Stone in 1978, the uh, Dynamics of Atmospheres and Oceans. I don't know. I, I read that as a grad student, and I could never quite decide if it was trivial or profound. Sometimes the, the best things are like that, um, where he came up with some arguments, which he made sound pr uh, pretty trivial. But I Maybe they are profound, and I, I know some people are starting to look at this. Uh, David uh, Battisti gave a very interesting s seminar writing a, a couple weeks ago on this. So you can see this in models, too. Um, so it, this, I think, also is, um, a, is a cautionary tale that if you're interested in climate, say, cl climate change, I'm trying to think about climate change a lot <laughs> these days, and you have to think on a regional scale because that's how it's going to uh, affect people l largely apart from sea level. And, uh, and, but you can't get very far with purely energetic arguments because the energetic arguments tell you that the two <laughs> hemispheres are the same, but obviously they can be very different. So that's, I think that's really one of the deepest puzzles is how you, how you get this. Now, Graham uh, Stevens has also been ar arguing that the uh, albedos are the same in the, in the two hemispheres. I don't know if that's related to this argument. I was never convinced by... Graham's arguments, but mayb maybe that was Graham. Um, um, I think it's a separate argument, yeah. So I don't... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess, of course, the problem with the real system is it could just be a fluke. It's only one, uh, one planet. But certainly when uh, 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 Battisti was giving a talk, he was showing model, uh, you know, varying rotation rate and various things. So there are some really interesting, in terms of the energy transport, it's, it's, I think it's a fascinating. I think this is somehow fundamental. Yeah, Stone made certain kinds of arguments that seemed like, like a built-in the answer. But I think, um, anyway, it's, a, uh, it's, it's worth looking. Maybe it would be worth looking at th that paper again. Um. Okay, so um, in in the tropics, the 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 energy transport is 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 carried by the Hadley cell. It's actually not to do with um, with heat because it's because the temperature is uniform. It's got to do with the um, wi with the gravitational potential energy and the fact that the polar branch is at higher altitude than the than the surface branch. But once you get into the mid latitudes, this is a transient. So transient means a d d d a departures from the time average. Um, Usually it's going to be, well, this is an annual mean. It's often done on a, on a monthly basis, um, so it, it's the day-to-day -day fluctuations. And it's a northward eddy flux of temperature, so it's like a V prime, T prime term. This is a zonal. The bar is, is going to be an average um, over time and also over longitude. And you see that the poleward heat transport is, uh, so orange is, p p sorry, northward. So it's positive here and um uh, negative here because it's it's a poleward heat transport in the in the southern hemisphere, so this is the macro turbulence. Uh, as um, term goes at least back to uh, uh, Isaac Held, so it to to uh, distinguish it from from small scale turbulence, and this ba basically arises from ba a baroclinic instability. It's not actually uh, true up here. You should ignore the 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 statement is 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 only true really down in the, in the lowest part of the atmosphere. You also have have these. Um, um, eddy fluxes I in the stratosphere, but that's coming from planetary waves, and it's sort of a different different story. But if we just focus down here, we see that 
you have this um, very strong forward heat transport. So you, you can just think of that as baroclinic instability, um, then just mixing. Um, through, through mixing, there'll be down, down gradient heat transport. Um, but this, 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 um, this turbulence, this macro turbulence, is organized into what are called storm tracks. And uh, so now what's plotted here are the, the vertical um, transient fluxes of temperature. So that would be like a W prime, T prime. Um, these things are going to be pr pr related because in very clinic, instability, the motion is always <laughs> slanting. But this is kind of a, um, this is a often a measure of the, of the baroclinic intensity. Um, and this is at 700, <laughs> so a bit complicated here. So first of all, it's, so it's, it's the upward um, uh, temperature fl flux, but it's at 700 hectopascal, which is the lower troposphere. So 700, so that's, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, three kilometers or, or something. Is a guess, so it's a low, lower troposphere um, and band pass. Okay, so what's often done is you you, you filter the time series and because um, um, there, there's different components at different scales, and I'll show that at least uh, I won't show this for 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 this quantity, but you know if uh, that the storms have a have a um, ha have a time scale of a, a few days, right? Especially in the winter, if you have a, a, a storm coming through, usually. In three, uh, three to five days, it'll be something different. Or in New England, it'll, it'll be 24 hours, maybe. But it's kind of that s several day time scale, which is what we, we, we call the synoptic eddy time scale. It's a time scale that you get out of bare clinic instability. Um, so it's, it's the t typical time scale of w w weather systems. So what's often done is so they, it's called the band pass. Um, it's so, so si six to two days. There are different uh, w windows that you could take, but this is to separate it from the lower frequency climate va uh, variations. So this is now a polar view, and what you see in the northern hemisphere is you see the, um, that the most, so th this is connected with, with um, uh, energy uh, uh, growth of the Bering Clinic eddies, and you can see that there's maximum um, just off the coast of North America, right, right, right over the Gulf Stream, basically, and also over the Kuroshio in, in, in the Pacific. So it's a very strong hint that the energy source is actually really coming from the um, from f from the warm o ocean temperatures. Um, and then in the su southern hemisphere, uh, we don't have the b the boundary currents. Of course, there's not nothing like the Gulf Stream or the uh, uh, Kuroshio. Um, but you still have a bit of a lo localization here. Um, uh, and, oh yes, I, w I guess I wanted to connect this back to, um, where do I show that? Yeah, okay, so this is now the um, transient eddy kinetic energy. So that would be a half u prime squared plus v prime squared. This is the eddy kinetic energy, EKE. And you see that it's also in, in the same places. If I just go back and forth here, this is also the annual mean. Um, it's it's actually a bit downstream, so you can see that the vertical he heat flux is just off the. Don't don't forget the air is flowing uh, uh, west to east here and here, and you see that the eddy kinetic energy maxima. Oops, where did I go? Oh, uh, no, this one. So we, we the the uh, the heat flux is ju just off the coast. And the kinetic energy is a little bit further, coming further downstream. And uh, in the southern hemisphere, it's also um, the growth is here. Just uh, orient myself here uh, uh, under Africa, but but the eddy kinetic energy is a little bit. Oh, sorry, keep getting confused here. Uh, um, yeah, sorry, here. Uh, that's the one I meant. The annual mean. The next one is seasonal. Um, so in some sense, this, this m makes sense that these things are going to be in the, in the same, in the same um, um, s sector because uh, if there's a vertical, um, for if you have strong winds I I in the upper troposphere, that, that's what we would call a vertical shear, du dz, um, and that implies by thermal wind, uh, uh, temperature gradients, baroclinicity, uh, 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 which means there's growth for, for eddies. Actually, interestingly enough, the one, if you remember the upper, the up, the up, the upper um, uh, tropospheric jets, the one feature you don't, if you look at the upper tropospheric jets, which was shown earlier, the one place that it doesn't match is uh, Australia. I have a hard time seeing it from, 
It's down here, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you need to get away from the screen. So um, the Australian jet is a subtropical feature. It's not really, it's not connected to a storm track. Right, so I've already, sorry, I, I was, um, this is the, um, I had really meant to show the jet, which is an earlier plot. Um, so the storm tracks are strong, so the ocean already said that one of the main reasons for that is the, is the heat supply from the ocean, which is warm in, in the winter season, which is when the storm tracks are strongest. There's also the fact there's less friction o o over the ocean, and that's actually an important feature, too. I, I remember some, it was unpublished, but Br Brian Hoskins a long time ago had shown results that, uh, yeah, they, that he never published, where he just varied the surface friction, and he got storm tracks out, out of that alone. You don't even need uh, 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 SSTs or anything. So that's part of the story as well. And there is this d d distinct downstream tilt, especially in the kinetic energy, which you can see actually around here, and especially in the northern hemisphere. So that's an important aspect of the uh, jets. And in this southern hemisphere, even there, there's a downstream tilt if you look carefully. Okay, well, actually, so there's a few things. I will talk about that uh, lecture five or six. Um, uh, so, it, but this is actually just, um, it, this is just to do with the damping of the eddies. So their argument was just that you get stronger. It's and not, not the vertical shear, it's just the effect on the eddies alone. Yeah, that they're less, less damped. But there are effects, there can be effect on the wind too, and I'll come back to that, but I'll, 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 uh, I'll save that because it's a bit of a complicated story, actually. But the simpler argument for the eddies is just that if you have less damping, then uh, the, uh, the eddies get more intense. Um, okay, so just as there's a seasonal cycle to the, um, to, 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 to the jets, there's a seasonal cycle to, to, to the storm tracks. They're strongest in the winter. The simple reason for that is in the, in the winter, you've got low temperatures at the high latitudes. Um, so you've got the strongest meridional temperature gradient I I in the winter season. And you've also got, um, yeah, uh, whereas in, in the summer, of course, you've got warm temperatures at the higher latitudes, so relatively weak temperature gradient um, or meridionally. Less so in the southern hemisphere but uh, than in the north. So this is now the same plots. This is the vertical um, transient flux of temperature, W prime, T prime, um, in the synoptic eddies, this band pass uh, frequency band. But this is now for northern winter, and you can see these really strong uh, structures over the North Atlantic storm track and, and the Pacific storm track, and a weak, weaker um, feature over the southern ocean. And if you just compare that with the nor northern summer and southern winter, we see now that the, 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 the northern storm track is much weaker um, in terms of the, uh, the energy fluxes. And now the um, southern has got stronger. So if I just toggle back and forth between those, you compare this with this, it's a massive change. There's much less of a change I in the southern hemisphere because the fact that the uh, Antarctic never warms up means you always have um, cold temperatures that are, that are uh, quite cold at the high, high latitudes, whereas in the northern hemisphere there's a much bigger seasonal cycle. So we get a much bigger seasonal cycle in storm tracks in the northern hemisphere. Yep. What was the first one? W prime. Oh, that that'd be the same thing. Yeah, buoyancy. So. Yeah, yeah. So in the ocean, you would talk about buoyancy, but the buoyancy is essentially temperature. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Because um, oceanographers have to worry about salt, for example. Yeah. And if sometimes if you're doing a Boussinesque modeling, then you would write it in terms of a buoyancy too, because you don't really have a temperature in a Boussinesque in quite the same sense that you would have it in the in a, in a compressible system. Okay. Um, now this is another. I, kn I know these these pl plots are going by f by fast. Uh, so this is another picture, but it's the same stuff now. Six to two day transient horse but now, now it's a horizontal fluxes um, so it's a, again lo lower troposphere in the northern w w w winter but superimposing this we have the t the temperature field itself I I in the contours and the colors with the scale shown shown here and then the arrows are the fluxes which I don't have a there's not a scale in here but the 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 flux of of, of temperature so and they s um, the thickness of the arrow, I guess, is the is is the strength of the flux. 
So uh, what you see in the northern hemisphere, remember the, the air is flowing this way. For example, over uh, ju just uh, off of Japan, you see you've got uh, very strong temperature gradients here because the, the contours are very close together and very strong he he heat fluxes, actually a little bit maybe downstream. Um, uh, and in the uh, Atlantic, um, e even more, more striking, you've got very strong heat fluxes where, where the gradients are, are, are very strong. So basically, to first order, the strongest heat fluxes are co-located with, with the strongest gradients. Uh, now, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's terrible. Um, from a baroclinic instability point of view, that, that makes sense, because it's the temperature gradients that provide the energy source for the baroclinic instability. But from a turbulence point of view, it doesn't make sense, because if you have a lot of flux, you should weaken the gradient, right? Because you can imagine there's actually two relationships. There's a relationship for the eddies, which would tell you that temperature gradients drive heat fluxes. But then there's a relationship for the eddy effect back on the mean flow, on, on the mean state, which is that where you have a strong heat flux, you should get a weak temperature gradient because you're, you're fluxing the gradients. So, so both of those things are true in principle, but obviously in this case, the first part of that dominates. So what this is, is, is essentially saying is that the restoring forces on the temperature must be very strong and that the damping must be uh, uh, um, very so, so strong that you don't really see the effect of the fluxes back on the, uh, on the gradient. And certainly that makes sense over the Gulf Stream and the Kuroshio because you've got very strong diabetic heating from from the surface. But it's kind of an I interesting aspect, and there's been a bit of, um, um, I won't get into this, may well, Isaac might, but I suspect not, that um, uh, this whole idea of whether the heat fluxes lead or lag the, 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 the temperature gradient is kind of an I interesting topic. And there's some, if you, you, uh, you, you can have a cycle, a, a, a limit cycle, where actually uh, you, you get an oscillation in, in some uh, simple models. Pedlowski's some of his original theories of weakly nonlinear uh, or baroclinic instability have that. And actually, um, well, actually, Lay, Lay, Lay has been looking at this wherever he is, I think, a little bit. So people are lo looking at this in terms of the storm tracks and finding these uh, oscillations. I don't know if you'll, if you'll be talking about that this week. But so it's ha actually kind of an I interesting area that there is, that there are cases where you do get this two-way feedback. But when you look, and that's more in the southern hemisphere is where you get it more cleanly, where things are more, more homogeneous. But certainly in the northern hemisphere, it seems that the diabetic is kind of a clamping of these heat fluxes. Um. Okay, so um, <laughs> momentum fluxes. Um, I've talked pretty yeah, about energy and heat now, but of course, momentum fluxes are very important. And uh, so you could say, actually, in terms of the budgets, if you th look at the equations of m motion, there's, of course, moisture, uh, which we've talked about a little bit. But in terms of the neighbor stokes equations, you have energy and m momentum. And there's mass, too, but we don't tend to worry about mass, except in a model that might not uh, conserve it. But in general, mass is a pretty trivial thing. But m momentum and e um, energy are the two fundamental um, conservation laws. And momentum. Um, uh, the eddy zonal momentum flux, this is the convergence in planar coordinates. It would be d, d by dy of u, u, well, it would be, um, did I say uh, eddy? Yeah. This is the momentum flux uh, 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 convergence. So there is a m momentum flux transfer by the Hadley circulation, but of course, if the Hadley circulation really was momentum uh, conserving, then there would be no transfer in the, in the uh, inviscid limit. So mainly we're, 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 we're concerned with the eddy transfers and I've forgotten if, if Tapia showed something like this, but this is, you see in the observations very clearly, if you plot the momentum, this is now in terms of uh, altitude rather than <laughs> pressure, but it's 10 kilometers or so, uh, upper troposphere. And you see that in both hemispheres, this is January, but in both hemispheres, you can see that there's momentum flux convergence in the jet, actually, and divergence from, from the sides. So this is, uh, there was always this classic question, what maintains the, 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 the westerlies? Of course, in the subtropics, you, you can argue the Hadley circulation. But once you get away from the uh, subtropics, you can't use that argument anymore. And it was recognized a long time ago 
at least 100 years ago, uh, Harold uh, Jeffries and so on, that this was actually a fundamental issue in the, in the, in the climate system, what maintains uh, the, the, the westerlies. And when there were uh, observations of momentum fluxes, they showed very clearly that there was this upgradient transfer. Now, again, from a turbulence point of view, that's very weird. Um, how can, you know, upgradient transfers? And there was a famous, actually, argument between um, Prantl and G.I. Taylor in the, in the 20s and 30s about whether it's vorticity or mo momentum that gets fluxed. And so there's some deep issues here. I'll talk about this not really now, but um, lecture uh, four, I guess. Um, it really, uh, are, uh, this the first order e explanation, you have to understand uh, wave properties and, and Rossi wave aspects. Because this was a, um, a long-standing uh, puzzle in the field. Um, but it's a very clear feature. And it's linked to the surface winds through the <laughs> momentum balance. That's my second equation for the, 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 the this morning. So the angular momentum budget, this is in pressure coordinates. We tend to work in pressure coordinates a lot in the atmosphere uh, because it's, it's, it's a convenient, it absorbs the density factor, makes a lot of cubic terms qu quadratic, so it's very useful. So this is d by dt. Uh, this is an integral I in pressure, and the overbar is a zonal average that's uh, going around a latitude circle. So we've got um, angular m momentum. I've got dp over, over g. That's just a, ma a mass coordinate, um, uh, and the g is there because of hydrostatic balance. a cos phi is the moment arm, and u is the relative velocity. So this is the relative part, what's, what's called the relative part of the angular <laughs> momentum not the so-called planetary part. Um, then th there's a Coriolis term here, times also the a cos phi, and v is the meridional uh, velocity. Actually, this can be uh, uh, understood as a, um, as a tendency of the mass. So uh, if you apply a torque to, to the system, to the atmosphere, part of the torque goes into changing the, the winds, the re relative part of the angular momentum, and part of it goes into a mass transfer, poleward or equatorward, and that's changing the so-called planetary part of the angular momentum, because the planetary part, this omega um, a squared cosine squared phi, it's a constant, but it's, but it's integrated o o over the column, and the surface pressure can be varying. So the mass can vary, and this can be thought of as a tendency of the mass, which is connected with the, with the meridional motion. Now, it, in a steady state, this will be zero, but certainly in a transient, um, this will be, be non-zero. So you can think of, of the right-hand side as being all the torques, and the left-hand side as being the, 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 the tendency, either of the relative component of angular momentum or the um, abs um, uh, planetary part of the angular momentum, which, as I say, has to do with, with, with the mass distribution of this uh, or, or the surface pressure distribution equivalently. So on the right-hand side, you've got the eddy, um, well, this would include mean in the way it's, it's drawn here, but th this is the, the, um, the um, angular m m uh, uh, momentum flux u times v. So v is the meridional wind, u is the zonal wind. So this is the usual eddy momentum flux. I think I wrote it here just with u and v, but this is in <laughs> spherical geometry, so you've got the a cos phi in there. And then there's, um, if you integrate over the whole whole atmosphere, then you pick up a few terms at the surface. Uh, so this is the only term I in the free atmosphere, basically. But then you pick up a term at the surface, which has to do with the fact that the, the, the integral of the surface pressure times, times the, the, the slope of the topography. This is a h is the height of the lower surface. So if you have a flat surface, this is zero. It'll, it'll, it'll integrate out. But of course, if you have mountains, then you can have um, a different pressure on one side th 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 than the others. This is called the mountain torque term. So this is an adiabatic torque coming from the exchange of angular momentum between the, uh, the solid Earth and the atmosphere. And then you have terms that in a model would be a parametrized. This is the subgrid orography, and this so there's a sur surface stress connected with the subgrid orography, and there's a sur surface stress connected with the planetary boundary layer. Um, so you can think of this as, I mean, you can maybe ig ignore this if you, wa if you want to think about it. This is the classic surface friction, and then th there's also this mountain torque term. So I I in a steady state, the these two terms on, on the left-hand side go, go, go to zero. The first is conservation of mass, right, because you can't have a mineral. Yep, sorry? Co 
a conservation of mass, because if you, if you had a net mass flux towards the pole, it would just keep it building up. So I said you can rewrite this as a d by dt of the surface pressure, or the d by dt of the mass, and the mass can't keep growing. So conservation, the, the continuity equation will, will tell you that this, this has to be zero in a steady state. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. In the, in the vertical, that's right. And so normally there would be a row, but we've observed that in the pressure. It's a pressure, it's a mass coordinate. Right, so in, I, I, in the steady state, you've got this balance between these, these four terms on, on, the, on, the, on the right hand side. And of course, we should be um, always careful. One of the, I was uh, uh, a postdoc with Michael McIntyre, who gave me a few gems, and one of them was. We, we, we tend to interpret the term on the right-hand side as a forcing and the term on the left-hand side as a response, but there's nothing fun. You can move terms back and forth, so you always want to be a little bit careful when, when people start putting terms on, on one side or, or the other. But it's convenient to think of this term balancing these three terms. So this is the free atmosphere. Um, this is the eddy momentum flux uh, uh, conver uh, uh, convergence because there's a d by d la latitude here, and these are, are the surface um, terms and it's the terms on the right hand side tend to act as a drag against the surface flow. Obviously, the the boundary layer term acts as a, as a drag. That will always be the case, I, I, I guess. Maybe there's some some uh, exceptions. So subgrid or orography is a roughness, so that tends to act as a drag. Mount torque doesn't have to, and there are uh, exceptions, but we we tend to assume it acts as a drag. So if these terms all act a as a drag, then you have this simple picture that the eddy momentum fluxes are, are, are driving a torque and, they're, and they have to be ba balanced by, by this. And in particular, um, um, if you know the drag, then you know what, if, if it's really as a drag, then you know from the sign of this, you know the sign of the surface wind. So that leads to this um, simple picture of the large scale, d d d d a dynamics view, you, you could call it, which is what Ta Tapia was saying, the surface flow is basically passive. That's true to first order. I mean, we're, we're mainly talking first order here. There are some exceptions, which I'll talk about uh, probably in the, in the final lecture. But in, the, in this large-scale dynamicist view, um, we think that the angular momentum uh, exerts a torque, and that torque has to be balanced in the end by the surface drags. This is the downward control paper from Haynes et al. A long time ago now. This is an idealized experiment. I said I would show only observations, but sorry, this, this is obviously not. Um, I think this is the one model result this morning. So this is where you apply a torque. This is a thinking of a, of, a, uh, of a stratosphere context, but the same principle applies. And this is actually probably a negative, well, it doesn't matter. We, we don't have signs here, but this is a ne negative torque driving a poleward flow. And this is in a simple um, model with, um, it's only symmetric, and the only f physics is that the surface drag is a, re a relaxational drag, like a re Rayleigh friction at the lower surface. So you're assuming that it's re re relaxational. And Newtonian cooling, which is to say that the radiation, if you war warm up the atmosphere, it'll cool radiatively. If you, war if you cool it, it'll warm. So that's also uh, relaxational. And in that case, the circulation has to close by going downward, because that's the only friction that you have. I I in the system. So of course there's a lot of, of assumptions here, but all things being equal, you can argue that the surface drag will then have to close here. And as long as there's no feedback from here, here to here, this is a, a consistent picture. Now the surface winds are easterly, and Tapio talked about the trade winds. Um, this is the, again, uh, he, he must have showed a very similar picture. This is the um, 10 meter wind, uh, 10 meter above, above the surface, annual mean. And you can see these uh, trade winds easterly in the tropics and very strong westerly, especially in the Southern Ocean. And that's consistent. Yep. Um, well, that's, that's interesting um, because actually I don't ha ha have the figure for this. Um, there's been an I in a comparison in, of course, these things are not not, not observed. Well, this, uh, this would be observed, I guess, but the, these are not. Um, th this is only important in uh, 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 certain areas. There was a comparison of weather forecast models um, a few years ago. So uh, weather forecast models are all pretty accurate models, right, because they're all pretty high, high resolution. They're all, of course, tuned to be accurate. And they looked at w w what was dominating. And the boundary layer term tends to dominate. But it turned out that the way that the different models partition these terms is very different. And actually, n not surprisingly, 
Eastern WF is at one limit, and the British Met Office is, is at the other limit, <laughs> which often is the case. So the, the Met Office uh, has very small amount of orographic drag in their model and a lot of boundary layer, and, th and the Eastman WF is the other way around. So, but uh, I think globally the, the, the PBL term dominates, but there are certain regions where, the, where, these, where these can be very important. And as I say, it's interesting, the models all seem to close their momentum budget in a different way, which is interesting, because there must be compensating errors somehow. So it's not, it's not well uh, uh, understood. That it, there's enough, that they're all important. And as I'll show a little bit on the final lecture, probably if you in, in a model, if you if you vary one of these a little bit, you can get pretty big changes in the jet. Yeah. Right. So if we just go back to the angular momentum budget, well, maybe I should go back to here actually. Uh, so what we have is if if we combine this this picture with with, with with this equation, what we see is that there's angular momentum transport into the westerlies out of the actually high latitudes as well as the lo lower latitudes. So what that is saying is that there must be removal of angular momentum um, in the mid-latitudes at the surface, which means a drag. And the winds are westerly, so the drag is, um, uh, is towards the west. It's a negative drag, and that, that, that balances the convergence. And equally, in the tropics, you have angular momentum transfer out of the tropics, which means that you must be putting angular momentum into the tropics at, at, at the surface. But if the, if, if the surface is a drag force, it must be the winds are easterly, because the easterly wind means that the drag is westerly, right? So the drag actually is a source of angular momentum in the tropics as long as the winds are easterly. So you maybe I didn't say that so well, but from the angular mo momentum budget, you then end and this and this kind of argument here. As long as you assume that this is a drag, uh, in, other, in other words, acting opposite to to the surface wind, then you get easterlies in the tropics. So the first order explanation of the easterlies into the tropics is the same explanation of the westerlies, namely angular momentum transfer. Um, by by, uh, by the eddies uh, out of the tropics, and I won't tell you how that happens. So we'll come to that in lecture four, uh, four and five, uh, uh, four, I guess. Um, but you see that the um, but the, but these sur surface winds are very important for a global climate. I'm not going to talk about the ocean really, but I just w thought I would um, quickly just mention a couple of ocean features. So um, this is the um, he annual mean heat flux um, of um, from from the atmosphere to to the ocean, okay. Observed ocean he, um, atmosphere ocean heat flux, and you see that there's a thin, strong negatives here over the Gulf Stream and the uh, Kuroshio. That means heat flux from the ocean to to the atmosphere, and that's got to do with the Gulf with the Gulf Stream and the uh, Kuroshio. And these are wind wind driven western boundary currents. So to do with these with these surface winds, this is part of the wind driven, not the thermohaline, but the wi wind driven circulation. Um, which is which has a very strong, which has a feedback as we've already seen uh, uh, on the storm track. So the winds feed back through the ocean temperatures um, uh, uh, on the eddies. And then you see also um, uh, very strong um, um, positive values here I in the tropics, and that's to do with um, transfer then from the atmosphere to the ocean, and that's got to do with these equatorial cold tongues, and that's also one of the one of the reasons why the uh, why the uh, uh, ITCZ isn't right on, uh, on the equator, and that's that's also a wind-driven feature. So it's a very simple. Uh, this is just Ekman balance. You can vary the tropical e e e easterlies give you um, ocean uh, upwelling, which will bring up cold waters, and therefore gives you this cold tongue. So some very very first-order as aspects of climate um, are all explainable um, of the ocean. I should say are uh, explainable from the wind-driven theory and the angular momentum budget of the atmosphere. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's of course everything including radiation and so on. So it's the net it's the net exchange from atmosphere into ocean, but where you have cold cold r relatively cold temperatures, then you're going to absorb more more heat. So the oceans absor absorbing heat in the deep in the deep tropics. Oh, this this has got to be to this has got to be total. Uh, this has got to be total. I think not just not just yeah yeah sensible and so on. Sure. 
The other thing is the ACC, the Antarctic <laughs> Circumpolar Current. I'm sure, sure you'll hear a lot about that next week. Um, it's, also, it's also really a coastal upwelling current, um, e effectively. The, the westerly su surface wind o over the southern ocean gives you this northward ocean Ekman transport, and that drives an upwelling. This is a very nice uh, figure, I think, originally from <laughs> Lynn Talley that um, describes how the Antarctic cir circumpolar per current links to these, to these different o ocean basins. And as Tapio said, that the, the, the details are quite different in the different basins. But they, they all come through, and this ACC is part of, uh, of the system. And it used to be thought that the um, thermohaline uh, circulation was mainly driven by uh, a, a convection and heat transfer in the Labrador Sea and that kind of thing. But I think it's becoming increasingly clear that the Southern Ocean is part of that whole system, actually. And it's not a simple ca cause and effect. Um, and so this is, and this is a wind-driven circulation. So it's very, very important for ocean heat uptake and the carbon uptake. So that's just a, a quick aside. I won't go into that. Uh, you can ask me about it a bit later. I know a little bit, but you can certainly, I'm sh I suspect you'll hear more about this. Next week, now this is from one of Tapio's r r review papers. Um, so coming back to the, um, the angular <laughs> momentum budget, I, just, I, I said the Hadley cell picture um, wasn't quite as simple as the first order explanation. So this is observations of the January, the northern winter Hadley cell. And we see, as, as, uh, as I said already, it's a very asymmetric. You basically have, um, this is southern hemisphere, so we have warming here and, uh, and, and um, de uh, descent here. But on top of that, the blue are the angular m momentum contours. That's this um, um, a cosine phi m, uh, omega a cosine phi plus u. So you see that the m it's dominated by, by but, 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 but by the planetary terms. So the first uh, first approximation, the blue curves are just plotting um, cosine squared of, of, of latitude. There's a little bit of a deviation because of the of the jet, but but largely these are these are vertical. But of course, right at the equator, where it's like a cosine squared phi, it's flat, um, and it gets even flatter because of the Hadley cell, uh, which e which irons things out. But you can see that the Hadley cell is crossing angular momentum contours here and certainly here I I in the southern, uh, I I in the summer cell. So the held and how theory was this um, in viscid theory where actually the angular m momentum gets homogenized and you get a circulation which is purely thermally driven and doesn't need any, any torques. But as long as, as the circulation is crossing angular m momentum contours, then there have to be torques. That's the angular m momentum balance basically. And so you see that there's that there's there's uh, it's crossing here and it's crossing here, and if we draw where the descent is and plot it with the uh, focus mainly o o on the eddy part, it's where the um, angular momentum, um, uh, 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 where the angular momentum flux goes from um, uh, 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 poleward to uh, equatorward. So the terminus of the Hadley cell is determined by the momentum flux. Convergence, which is not something that a tropical person tends to think about, in uh, is, oh, it's all th th thermally driven, but it, it do does seem to be very important. Um, and exactly how this I interplay works is 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 a very open question because you, of course, you have to assume that you know what the angular momentum fluxes are, but they also r r r respond to the Hadley cell. So there is some kind of a balance struck between this. It's very important for the Hadley cell. Um, okay, finally, um, I'm just going to show two last things about uh, variability, and then, then we can stop and see if there's any questions. So um, somebody, we were having a discussion over breakfast whether EOFs are physical or not. Well, there's something called the annular modes. Um, used to be called the Arctic and Antarctic uh, uh, oscillation based on empirical orthogonal functions. But I think, as I s said, I think al already uh, you're perfectly entitled to integrate around, around the, 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 uh, uh, the globe, and we do have an angular momentum balance. And later in the week, I'll talk about the angular <laughs> momentum balance for these things. So one, the dominant mode of variability, if you just look at these um, zonally averaged <laughs> properties, you get a variability in the, the mid-latitude jet, which is a back and forth. It's a, a, a meridional shift. And if we f this is a zonal wind, and this is just uh, showing these annual modes. This is a s southern hemisphere, <laughs> 60 south here and the northern he hemisphere, 60 north. Ignore the uh, stratospheric part of it, which is sort of something different, but you get a, this back and forth shift of the jet um, 
that's called the annular mode because it's somewhat annular. These are now um, polar views of the surface geopotential, and you, you see that its to first approximation is only symmetric ar around, around the a Antarctic a a and the Arctic, although there's quite a strong asymmetry. And in the northern hemisphere, there's a very strong uh, projection on something called the North Atlantic o Oscillation, which may not be a real oscillation. Um, so there's, uh, there's some I I interesting aspects of that, but I haven't really talked about large-scale variability yet, but I'm just that's why I'm talking about this. This is a very important feature for climate and, and um, seasonal prediction, for example, and climate va va variations are, th are the wobbling <laughs> back and forth of the jet stream, um, call these annular modes. And as I say, there is if you if you take the zonally averaged view, then you can write a, a, at least an equation for it, um, and you um, comes from the, the momentum balance, and we'll talk about that. There's not really a theory for this feature, and it's interesting though it it always pops up. So there's kind of an op open question as to why the annular modes have this NAO, uh, very strong NAO feature. And actually one of the, um, as an aside, one of the main uh, drivers of this variability in the northern hemisphere I in the winter is the stratosphere. And if you have a stratospheric sudden w warming where the vortex gets very warm and the vortex breaks down actually, you get a very strong imprint o on the troposphere, um, which actually has this pattern. And a uh, very nice study by um, Peter Hitchcock and Isla Simpson, they just imposed the zonally symmetric perturbation in the stratosphere in a model, and they get the zonally asymmetric response. So it's, there's something in the coupling between the planetary waves uh, between the troposphere and the stratosphere, which, which gives you this very strong lo localization, even if the perturbation is purely symmetric. But that's not understood theoretically. And finally, um, Blocking, which I'll just mention very quickly because we should talk about some of the phenomena. Um, there's no e e EOF for this, uh, but it's a very important phenomena for weather is b a blocking, which is uh, basically wh when, when, when the e um, east-west flow, the uh, westerlies become um, blocked, uh, uh, stuck for um, a few weeks. This is a two-week average, so February 1st to February 14th in 2012, it's 0.25 sigma, that, that, that's a fraction uh, of the surface pressure. So that's about 250 he hectopascal, so uh, upper troposphere. And you see these two classic ridges. There's a Pacific block and uh, uh, Atlantic block, and these can per uh, persist for very long, as I say, uh, up to, say, two weeks. And actually, a lot of extreme weather events are connected with, with blocks. So cold spells I in the winter are invariably c uh, connected with a blocking state where you get, for example, in, in a particular region, a lot of air coming down from the north uh, fr from uh, higher latitudes. And warm spells, uh, heat waves also are tend to be connected with, with blocks, for example, over Europe where you get um, where the, uh, the continent gets uh, isolated from, from, the, um, from the air coming off the ocean, and then you can get drying out of the surface and really, really strong heat waves. So uh, blocking is a really, really important uh, phenomenon. It is turbulent. It's coherent, but in a very, uh, um, on, uh, uh, there's no agreement on how to characterize blocks. And actually, there was a blocking a workshop at uh, Reading a couple years ago, and they spent the whole, <laughs> I was, I was dropping in and out, but there was a, a lot of panel uh, discussions on how to define blocks. And there's no uh, agreement, and if you do climate change, and you, the result of climate change depends on your blocking metric. So it's a very unsatisfactory uh, field in that in that r r r r respect. I mean, from a, a theoretical point of view, no one knows how to even define things, but it's hugely uh, important. Models don't tend to get this right. There's no there's no theory for this, so I, I won't even talk about this because there's no accepted. I should say there's no ex accepted theory. There were a long time ago some arguments about uh, solitons and. Uh, resonance, so there are some ideas around, but it's not like the annular modes where you have angular <laughs> momentum budget, and we can really write equations from first principles. There's no equations from first <laughs> principles that will give you <laughs> blocking. So it's a very fa fascinating topic, and um, I think we need more theorists working on this. I, I mean, I, I remember in the 1980s, there were a lot of theorists thinking about this, but then the field seemed to die. I guess it was just too hard. And now it, it, people study it in models, but there's not really much theory. And I think it seems like it's a very, very important. But these are kind of quasi-coherent <laughs> structures. I mean, th th this isn't like a red spot or something that's that lasts forever. They're very transient, but there is something uh, special about them. So I just m mentioned that out of uh, uh, completeness, but I won't be able to talk about that. Yes, Brad? 
the resonance stuff? Yeah, so there are some arguments, and the Potsdam group has been pushing this most, I think, that you can get waveguides. Um, I guess I have a plot on that later, but not, not right now. There are some waveguides connected with the jet. So the, there were some arguments about a resonance, actually, Legras and Gill, for example, in the 80s. But you had, to put, 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 you, had, you had to put the atmosphere in a channel, which, of course, isn't natural. So what you need is something that will give you a channel-like <laughs> geometry. So there are some arguments for that. Um, I don't want to be, I mean, I wouldn't want to ru rule them out, but I, there's no accepted uh, view of that. I think it's still very controversial, and I think there are a lot of uh, respectable people that will say it's <laughs> nonsense. I think that's probably a bit, a bit strong. We have to be o open-minded, but uh, it's, it's, it's really hard to make it uh, precise, yeah. So there's some hope there maybe, but I wouldn't want to go further than that. This particular one, yeah. No, no, it can happen uh, separately. So I, I don't, no, actually, I don't even know if there's theories. It's true, a resonance theory should be global. That's actually, that's one of the arguments against resonance theory is that if you just do, do the math on, on the time to go around and everything, it's a little bit hard to argue that you have a waveguide all the way around. You can get a local, you know. So maybe there could be some quasi-local resonance that's not a pure resonance that might be something, I don't know. I haven't really followed that field. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In in the winter, there's a very strong correlation between the blocking and the NAO index. But a lot of wh when you read a lot of it, people say it's explained by the NAO. But it's a two two sides of the same coin in a, in a way. So the, there's a strong correlation. But NAO will be of course connected with 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 jet going um, uh, uh, north or south. So and since there's no theory for the NEO. It's not really... A, a it's a metric, sure. Um, oh, I see. Um, yeah, but it's not It's not enough. Um, so usually people want overturning contours of some kind, so there's some... Uh, plus you want a persistence in there. I guess you, you could have a persistence of NEO. Um, um, I yeah, people don't tend to do that. I guess, I guess part of the reason is in summer, it's a different phenomenon. So in summer, the blocking tends to be over land, and actually you get land surface uh, feedback. So it's kind of a th thermally driven feature, at least o over Europe. So it's I don't think it's connected to the NAO uh, in the summer. But most people are using some sort of index that's in the free atmosphere rather than at the surface pressure. Uh -huh. So everybody knows NAO. Oh, so okay. Okay, so it's basically the the uh, that's that's what's called the NAO, and it's basically the the surface pressure um, at Iceland mi minus uh, um, uh, at the uh, uh, Azores no <laughs> normalized. So it's of course th the point about the these stations is there are. Uh, observations. So there's a long-term uh, record. It's over 100 years long. And it was recognized that there's a, d a kind of a dipole. Um, I guess you can see it uh, a little bit. Actu actually, you can see it here. Um, so I Iceland's maybe not the best place, and the Azores maybe isn't the best place. But that's <laughs> historically where, where people had the long-term measurements. And so it was recognized for a long time. There was a lot of work in the early part of the 20th century on climate indices, you know, of various sorts for vi variability. And it was realized that this is very strongly correlated wi with weather systems over Europe. And so in um, one kind of e extreme phase uh, of the NAO, you'll, you'll, you'll get the storm track going over northern Europe, and you'll get a uh, lot of rain over northern Europe and, and dry over southern Europe. And in the other phase, it's, it's the uh, other way around. So pretty much every meaningful climate I I I indicator um, in the wintertime anyway uh, is I over Europe is going to be connected with the NAO, o over Western Europe at least. Um, so it's, it's manifested I in the surface pressure. And as I say, it's a very good uh, field because we have ob observations. Of course, people also um, try to define it using e e EOFs based on analyses. But then, of course, you're relying on, on reanalyses, which have their own issues and so on. So there's something nice about the, 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 
the surface pressure. But there's, there, there's no theory of the NEO, and it's not even, a, you probably shouldn't even put the O here. People tend to put O at the end of things, like AMO, PDO. We, we have a tendency to call things o oscillations. What they mean is that if you do a frequency <laughs> spectrum, you see a bump somewhere that's a bit low in, in the low frequency. But is that really, is it just r r red noise, or is there some sort of... Uh, some sort of uh, feedback or oscillation, I, I, it's an open question. So it's, it's a very important, um, I mean, whether the NAO is the best I index or not, I don't know, but it's, it's certainly a very robust index. Um, and it's a very, very important climate variability and possibly climate change too. So it's, uh, um, um, but until you can define something, I mean, you know, for a mathematician, you have to have a well-posed question. So I'm not even sure with m blocking an NAO how you would begin to pose the question. It's actually a bit of a challenge. Yes, Lee. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, you certainly get blocking in dry models. I think in the winter time, uh, I don't know. Uh, there are some. Ar I I don't really know for sure. I shouldn't. I can't give you a, 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 a authoritative answer. There probably are some arguments. There are some arguments that moist. Some of the people at <laughs> Reading actually have been arguing that the moist processes in 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 a, w a, w a wintertime storms are an important part of setting the PV the potential vorticity a a a in the upper troposphere from warm uh, uh, conveyor belts and stuff like that. So th there could be some arguments for PV gradients and and diabatic processes that to do with moisture in in the winter. In I in the summer, it is, to my uh, uh, understanding, very much connected with um, drying out of the surface. If you get a really strong blocking o over Spain, you can get, for example, these big thermal sources. So it's not moist process in the atmosphere. In that case, it's more moist processes at the surface. So I think it's not, it's it's obviously <laughs> not essential because you, you can get blocking in, in dry models. But it, uh, for details, I mean, uh, and I, well, well one of the issues is that for many things that to do, if you really want to think about climate change, you have to be quantitative. Um, and so things that are not, don't matter to first order may may matter to second order. Okay, we're at 10.30, so I guess, um, thank you. And if you have, so I, yeah, can I meet with the five people that put, put their hands up? And if you have uh, uh, questions about geostrophic balance or thermal wind or something like that and you're too shy to put up your hand, just come and talk to me.